This evening, we have an opportunity once again to revisit the biblical holy day that is first introduced in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24. We discussed this holy day, some of you will remember, the very first session of Yeshivat Sharashim just about a year ago. At the time, we focused upon why altogether we call this day Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year, considering that in the verse I just cited, again, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24, it is explicitly described as taking place on the first day of the seventh month. But again, that was a discussion we had last year. We're not going to address it now. The point with which I'd like to begin this evening is in considering the manner in which this extraordinary day is introduced in Scripture. It is described as again, in the seventh month, on the first day, you shall have a day of ceasing from productive labor, zichron teruah, a remembrance of blasting, which of course, for the purposes of the title of the session, since blasting would sound awfully strange here, we take to refer to the shofar blasts. But this is the word, folks, teruah, blasts, blasting, a remembrance of blasting. And of course, inevitably, we need to understand what is it? What does it mean? And what, in particular, is this remembrance supposed to be about? Or to be more specific, remembering what, when, and for whom? Okay, we've kind of addressed the question of when. What is it? And for whom is it? It's interesting to note that this is not the only context in Scripture in which we find a juxtaposition of blasting, the Teruah, with the subject of remembrance. We find a similar kind of juxtaposition, not exactly the same as we shall see, in Numbers chapter 10. What happens in Numbers chapter 10 is God commands Moses to make two trumpets. It's not a shofar here. It's a trumpet. Rather than an instrument that is fashioned from something in the natural world, like a ram's horn, this is something fashioned artificially from metal. But for our purposes, what is relevant is what we read with respect to the use of these trumpets in Numbers chapter 10, verse 9. When you come to war in your land against the adversary who is causing you anguish, then the Torah tells us in the Hebrew, Vahareotem Bachatsotserot. Vahareotem is the verb form that is associated with the same root as Teruah. So I guess the best way to translate this would be, You shall blast with trumpets. And the consequence of that, here we get to the remembrance, is, And you will be remembered before God your Lord and be saved from your enemies. So again, 
we have the blasting, and we have the remembrance. It's interesting to note that the blasting in Leviticus isn't explicitly associated with any instrument. We, of course, have a tradition that the instrument of choice is the shofar. In Numbers chapter 10, the instrument is explicitly designated, and it's not a shofar, but this act of producing the teruah, the blasting sound, is here again associated with remembrance. So evidently, this blasting is something significant. But again, we'll ask, what's the significance? What does it do? What is it for? Who is it for? That this blasting, the teruah, is something significant, I should note, emerges in a different context from a strange statement that we read in Psalms. In Psalms chapter 89, verse 16. The text, again, in the Hebrew, Hebrew would be a tremendous asset for our discussion this evening. Ashrei ha'am yodei teruah. Fortunate is the people who know the teruah. Again, this is the teruah, the blasting sound. God, by the light of your countenance, they go. Well, clearly, knowing the teruah has something to do with going by the light of God's countenance. But besides that, strange statement, isn't it? What's so important about knowing the teruah? After all, if it's simply a matter of being able to produce the sounds, it doesn't sound like something so very important. Uh, mind you, it's not so easy to produce a true ah sound. I must admit personally, I can't do it. But be that as it may, the sound itself doesn't seem to be something so significant. Yet again, in Psalms, it is the sound that the people are summoned to know. And again, in both Leviticus and Numbers, the sound of the Torah is associated with remembrance. Before we embark upon trying to elucidate what that means, there's another verse from Psalms that I think is instructive here because, you know, as we noted, the association of the shofar with the teruah is something that we don't find explicitly, actually, anywhere in the Torah. But we do find an important juxtaposition of the teruah with the shofar. And this undoubtedly is also an important insight in understanding what it means. In Psalms chapter 47, in verse 6, the Lord ascends through the Torah. Again, this blasting. God through the sound of the shofar. Now, of course, you're all familiar with the poetic style of the Psalms, the couplets in which there are two parts of the verse that reflect the same idea in different words. So, of course, the Lord ascends through the teruah, God through the sound of the shofar. The teruah is a sound of the shofar. It isn't the only one, but that's something that we'll leave for a bit later 
in our session now. What we need to understand is what, again, is the significance of this to uh, It is, after all, the defining theme of this upcoming biblical holy day. And, of course, simultaneously we note that it has this cryptic association with remembrance that we still haven't elucidated. So, to focus, at least initially, on the subject of the remembrance. The problem, I dare say, is fairly transparent to all of us. God, obviously, does not need any reminders. There's no need for remembrance. And in particular, again, in Numbers chapter 10, the verse spoke of being remembered before God. And that remembrance being the basis of salvation. So what does it mean? Of course, at the outset, we know the whole modality of Scripture in describing God in terms that, of course, are borrowed from the world of man, to use the technical term, anthropomorphisms, speaking about God in the language of people. Well, we don't have any other vocabulary other than the language of people. So, of course, we're going to be speaking about God in such terms. But inevitably, we need to understand what's the anthropomorphism telling us here in speaking of remembrance. And this brings us to our first level of response. As we shall see, there's going to be more than one. Our first level of response is noting how in Scripture, remembrance is often a verb that carries the connotation of judgment. So, for example, if we turn to Ezekiel chapter 18, the prophet here describes the consequences of those who choose either well or badly. So, in verse 21, the prophet describes the wicked person who repents of his wickedness and keeps all of God's statutes and does justice and righteousness and promises he will surely live through that repentance. And in verse 22, that's what's key to understanding remembrance, all of the crimes that he did will not be remembered to him. In the righteousness that he did, he shall live. But of course here, remembered means judged. Remembrance is being used to refer to judgment. In much of the same vein, but with a very different context, just a couple of verses later, in verse 24, the prophet describes the opposite case of one who is righteous, who reverts to a path of injustice, abomination, wickedness. And the prophet tells us, all of the righteousness that he did will not be remembered. That is, again, recognizing that remembrance means judgment. What the prophet is telling us is, you are judged based upon who you are, not who you were. And if you were one thing, but you've become another, then for better or for worse, you're judged in the present. Of course, again, the linguistic relevance is you're judged is described as remembered. 
So we learn from here that remembrance can indeed refer to judgment. So just consider another couple of examples. There are very many in scripture, and I certainly don't intend to belabor the point, but if you look likewise, in Psalms chapter 25, verse 7, the prayer of the psalmist, of David, is the sins of my youth and my crimes don't remember. In your kindness, remember me. And of course, again, we recognize when the, when the psalmist speaks about remembering, he means judging. That is, don't judge me for the crimes of my youth, but rather judge me in your kindness. That remembering refers to judging. And the final example, this is a recurrent theme in the words of Nehemiah, beginning in Nehemiah chapter 5, in verse 19. Remember for me, God, for the good, all that I did for this people. And of course, again, remember me for the good. Judge me positively. Again, a recurrent theme in particular in chapter 13. But in all these instances, again, remembering means judging. Why am I belaboring this point? Well, I couldn't help it, but what, of course, is significant in this application of the meaning of remembering is, remember, this upcoming holy day is a remembrance, a remembrance of the blasting, of the shofar. A remembrance means, just by simple translation, based on what we've seen, a day of judgment. And of course, by ancient tradition, that is precisely what this day is. It is the universal day of judgment. The day of judgment for all flesh, for all of humanity, for everyone. As we noted last year as well, while typically this holy day, which Jews call Rosh Hashanah, is described as a Jewish holy day, it is in fact, of course, a biblical holy day. And while the biblical holy days are especially relevant to the nation of Israel, for the most part, they pertain to specific historical events with which they are associated that took place for Israel, this one is different. This one has a theme that is explicitly universal because the judgment is indeed universal. That's the remembrance. So again, it is using human terms, speaking of remembrance. But we appreciate the theme of judgment. This, I reiterate, is our first level of understanding of what the remembrance means. First, but not last. Because inevitably, of course, we still need to consider what this remembrance means for us. Recall in Numbers chapter 10, the remembrance was a consequence of your doing something, blowing the trumpets. In Leviticus chapter 23, that isn't explicit, but it certainly is implied. Because again, Moses is told to speak to Israel in telling them about this holy day, this holy convocation that is a remembrance of the blasts of the shofar. Well, if we're supposed to know about that, presumably we're supposed to be doing something active. Merely being judged is not doing something active. So 
what's our role in this remembrance? In order to appreciate the answer to this critical question, we need to dig more deeply into just what Teruah means. And here again, I have to note that it would be much easier for us to conduct this session in Hebrew, because then the meaning of the words becomes far more transparent. But we'll do the best we can by way of translation. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, what indeed is the root of Teruah? And what levels of meaning can we discern in this word by analyzing whence it comes, what its etymology is? And indeed, it's interesting to note what the root of Teruah is. Teruah comes from a root that means shattering, breaking. Acoustically, the tru'a sound is a broken sound. But when we consider how this root appears elsewhere in Scripture, we certainly get a very keen sense of what it implies. Well, again, I'm not going to over-belabor the point. I'd just like to share with you a couple of examples to make the meaning of the root clear. If we turn to Isaiah chapter 24, verse 19. Isaiah uses the root in a context that makes it very clear what it means. Lo ahit lo ahaaretz. Translation. The earth is utterly shattered. Lo ahit lo ah comes from the same root as to ah, this word over here. And the continuation. Indeed, in a similar vein, the earth is utterly crumbled, the earth is utterly collapsed. The shattering is the reflection of the same root of Teruah. And likewise, similarly, in Psalm chapter 2, Verse 9, you shatter them, referring to the nations that rebel against God, with an iron rod. And again, the shattering comes from the same root as Teruah. Breaking. Again, shattering, brokenness. To consider more directly, how this relates to the Teruah, we'll note first that in the book of Joshua, remember the battle of Jericho? The walls come tumbling down. When do the walls come tumbling down? In Joshua chapter 6, verse 20. We read that Vayara Ha'am which is the same verb, the people are making this blasting sound. And when the sound of the shafar is heard, the people blast this great blasting sound. Shattering. How do you know what happens? Everything shatters. The wall fell down where it was, the wall shattered. The Teruah, the shattering sound, elicited indeed the shattering. But of course, what that tells us about what shattering means and how it bears upon remembering is the primary focus 
of this exercise for us. In the ancient world, the Teru'ah sound blasted from the shofar was the equivalent of the air raid siren, the summons to war, the warning. There are innumerable examples of the shofar figuring in that role in Scripture. To cite just one, in Jeremiah, in chapter 4, verse 19, the prophet, in his prophetic eye, beholds the impending destruction, the impending doom for Judah and Israel. And the way he describes it, chapter 4, verse 19, my innards, my innards become enfeebled. The walls of my heart are moaning because I heard the sound of the shofar. The teru'ah, the blasting of war. Shofar, teru'ah, blasting, shattering, siren, battle, destruction. Remembrance, well, just like any siren, it's a wake-up call. Get up. Look around you. See what's going on. Remember. Remember because all so often we forget. We become inattentive. We stop paying attention. And the shofar is there to wake us up. As the prophet Amos asks rhetorically in chapter 3, verse 6 of Amos, can a shofar be blown in a city and people not tremble? Because of course they'll tremble. It's a wake-up call, and everyone wakes up. So, getting back to that theme of remembrance, the Tru'ah is then the mechanism for being remembered positively before God, meaning again, being judged positively before God, precisely because it is a remembrance for us. A wake-up call. And as we saw, of course, in Ezekiel chapter 18, you're judged based upon who you are, not who you were. So if you wake up and make yourself into one who is worthy of being positively remembered, then you will be remembered for the good. Then you have the promise that God judges favorably. And of course, inevitably, this adds a whole additional level of both depth and, most importantly, responsibility to us in this remembrance. But there's an additional dimension that we haven't addressed yet. And this, inevitably, forces us to consider not just the word teru'ah, but you see over here on the screen there's another word also, tekiah. Now why am I confusing you with these two ostensibly similar Hebrew words? Because on the one hand they are similar. They both refer to sounds that are produced by the shofar. <laughs> 
but they have very different connotations. And understanding the connection between them here is critical as well. Remember the verse we mentioned at the beginning from Psalm 89, verse 16. Fortunate is the people who know the Tu'ah. Now again, the Tu'ah, as we've seen, is that sound of brokenness, the shattering wake-up call. And yet, who know the Tu'ah? No, in the Hebrew, yodei, from the root of yada, is a word that in Hebrew has a much more sublime connotation than merely knowledge. It means intimate knowledge, indeed. It's a verb that carries the connotation of the greatest intimacy. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, Adam knew his wife Chava, referring to the greatest intimacy between two people. Now, shattering doesn't sound like intimacy. If anything, it sounds like the opposite. But we need to consider here again the interplay between these two words, Tua and Tkia and in particular, the difference between them. Let's turn back to Numbers chapter 10. We've already been there in noting the theme of remembrance, but at this juncture, I'd like to focus upon the difference between the Tekiah and the Teruah. In particular, if we consider on the one hand, verse 3, and similarly, verse 7, verse 3 reads that Aaron's sons, who are the ones who are, it becomes clear in the continuation of the passage, blow the trumpets, they're the ones who are in charge of the blowing, they shall blow the trumpets as a signal for all of the assembly to come to you to the tent of meeting. The verb here is not the verb of tua, it's the verb of tkiah, tak'u, blowing the tkiah sound. The tkiah sound isn't the broken sound. It is rather a long, continuous sound, completely unbroken. And it is the tkiah that summons people to come together. Likewise, in verse 7, when you assemble the assembly, titkiu velotariu, you shall blow the simple, continuous sound, not the broken sound. This, of course, in marked contrast to what we read in verses 4 and 5, that in verse 4, we're still speaking about the simple tkiah sound as a means for ingathering the princes of the people. In verse 5, it is the tuah sound, the broken sound, that serves as the summons for people to take down their tents, break up camp, and get ready to move. Note, the broken sound is the signal to break up camp. The simple continuous sound is the signal to come together. The drama, the tension between coming together and breaking everything down is the tension between the tikiah sound and the truah sound. Now, I realize this sounds very subtle acoustically, but it's important to note that this is the meaning of the verb 
associated with Akia, Lit Koa. That, much like the verb associated with Tua, is not only associated with making sounds. That is, in Genesis chapter 31, verse 25, Jacob pitches his tent. Well, the verb for pitching a tent is taka. Same root as tkia. It's not shattering, breaking, taking anything apart. Rather, it's building, fixing up. And similarly, in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 23, we read about fastening the stake in a place where it will be stable and immovable. Fastening the stake, fixing it. Same root, utkativ, as the tkiah. What a dramatic difference between these two nouns and verbs. Again, even acoustically. The tua is the broken sound. The tkiah is the continuous and unbroken sound. The verb associated with tua means shattering, breaking. The verb associated with tkia means building, pitching, fixing, bringing together. So, of course, inevitably, we consider the implications of this, too, in understanding what remembrance means. Because, after all, the remembrance is for the good. There's the shattering and the breaking. But it means, after all, to coming together, to returning to God. There is that broken sound of the Torah, but again, in Psalm 89, fortunate is the people who know the Torah, knowing with that connotation of intimacy, of closeness, that paradoxically derives specifically from the Torah. So, uh, isn't this an inconsistency, if not an outright contradiction? How can we speak, on the one hand, of all of this coming together and closeness and intimacy and fixing, and on the other hand, speak about judgment, shattering, brokenness? Really, isn't it a contradiction? Of course, the answer is... No. On the contrary. It all really does come together. And to appreciate why, I think it's instructive for us to consider the message at the end of Psalm 96. Now, mind you, the verses at the end of Psalm 96 have nothing to do with blowing a shofar or producing either the sound of the trua or the sound of the tekiah. Yeah, but it's all about a context that's very near at hand when we consider the message of this day of remembrance of judgment. In Psalm 96, in verse 11, we read, The heavens are happy, the earth rejoices, the sea and all that is in it thunder, the fields exult with all that is in them, then the trees of the forest are filled with glee. Wow! What exultation, what rejoicing, what happiness. What are they so excited about? 
And the following verse, in verse 13. Before God, for he has come. He has come to judge the earth. He judges the world in righteousness and peoples in his faithfulness. This is the reason for the rejoicing. Because the day of God's judgment is close at hand. What's to celebrate? Ah, what's to celebrate? Remember the expression at the beginning of the verse? Before God, for he has come. For he has come. Note the doubling, the point of emphasis. The rejoicing is because of precisely this intimacy. He is come. So, of course, we recognize that the inevitable consequence associated with his coming is judgment. But he's coming. And that's what matters the most. After all, as we've noted on a number of occasions in the past, what matters, what really matters, has a lot to do with your perspective. The final verse of Psalm 73, the Song of Asaph, the last verse. And as for me, Closeness to God is the good. That's the definition, folks. If closeness to God is the good, then when God is coming, I celebrate. That he's coming to judge is a reality, but it's not going to change the celebration. The celebration is still precisely because God indeed is coming. And when one considers what the message of that coming then is, he starts to appreciate how it really is all about remembrance. Remembrance. Remembering. Getting a perspective. Looking back and looking forward as the basis for that extraordinary closeness that is judgment, but that is the greatest good. So we look back, remembrance, remembering all the way back to the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, after Adam and Eve have sinned, still we read, they heard the voice of God the Lord going through the garden. They hear this voice. It's God, and it is a summons. And in the next verse, God the Lord calls to Adam, where are you? And then, of course, as we've noted, it's not a question. It's a rebuke. Look what has become of you. Where were you before? And where are you now? They sinned. But they still heard the call. They still were that close. And we remember. We remember that extraordinary closeness to God with which humanity embarked upon its historic journey. That closeness, that starting point, 
and the assessment year by year. Where have we gone in the interim? And we hear the sound of remembrance, which is, after all, what the shofar is, that sound of remembrance, and we remember. Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. Israel at Mount Sinai. On the third day, at morning, there was thunder and lightning and a heavy cloud upon the mountain. And the sound of the shofar, exceedingly strong. The sound of the shofar that accompanies the most intimate revelation of God to humanity in the world, in revealing his word, in revealing his teaching, in revealing his law to the world. Divine revelation. And that's with the sound of the shofar. And we remember, we remember another sound of the shofar. In Samuel 2, chapter 6, verse 15, in almost the exact same words, also in Chronicles 1, chapter 15, verse 28. King David and all the house of Israel bringing up the holy ark, the ark of the covenant to Jerusalem. And they bring it up with the teruah sound and the sound of the shofar. To establish that extraordinary basis of divine revelation in the midst of the nation on an ongoing basis in the Holy Temple. Not yet built, but there's already the sound of the shofar heralding that closeness that intimacy. And we remember. And we remember, we already noted the words of the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 4, in verse 19. The prophet warning of impending doom for a nation that has turned its back on God's message as conveyed through his prophets. And the prophet speaks of his innards churning because the sound of the shofar my soul has heard, the teruah, the blasting sound of war. And the following verse, brokenness upon brokenness. Because the Tua, after all, is that broken sound. And we remember the brokenness. The shofar accompanied the holy ark on the way to the building of the holy temple. And it is the shofar, a very different shofar, that accompanies the withdrawal of that intimacy, the withdrawal of that closeness in the destruction. It's all about remembering. Remembering the closeness to God when it was so present you could feel it. Remembering the closeness to God when it is fading, disappearing. Both are messages of closeness. And as we noted, it's remembering the past and also the future. In Isaiah chapter 27, verse 13, And it shall be on that day, 
a great shofar will be blown. And those who are lost in the land of Assyria and those who are cast away in the land of Egypt will come and bow down to God in the holy mountain in Jerusalem. That's remembering something that is not yet, but it's coming. And it's coming with the shofar. And likewise, in Yoel, chapter 2, verse 1, Blow the shofar in Zion. Hariu, which is from the root of Tua, blast in my holy mountain. All the inhabitants of the earth will quake because the day of God is coming. It is near. Again, the intimacy, it's coming. And similarly, in the first chapter of Tzifanya, in verse 14, close is the day of God that is great. Close and exceedingly swift. The sound of the day of God bitterly screaming there is the mighty one because God's day is come a day of wrath is that day a day of travail and difficulty a day of tempest and storm a day of darkness and blackness, a day of cloud and mist. In verse 16, a day of the shofar and of teruah. That is the great day of God that is coming. And likewise, in Zechariah, in chapter 9, God will be revealed upon them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning, and God the Lord will blow the shofar. Again, the sound of the shofar. And finally, in this progression, Isaiah, again, chapter 18, in verse 3, all the inhabitants of the earth, all who dwell on earth, will hear when the shofar is blown, because it's a summons. It's a wake-up call. It's the ultimate remembrance. It is at its most deep a call to come back home to return to God it is a sound that really is the high note of a vast crescendo just consider how the book of Psalms concludes There's a progression, but the progression in the last chapter of Psalms goes beyond words. Praise God in Psalm 150, verse 3, with the blowing of the shofar. And there's a long list of additional instruments, and in verse 5, praise Him in the timbrels of the Teruah. That inarticulate sound that goes 
beyond language. And finally, the next wor verse, which is the last verse in Psalms, that every breath, praise God, hallelujah, every breath, beyond words, beyond expression, a closeness that goes beyond what you can describe. So all we have left is the shofar, the remembrance. The remembrance, the closeness, closeness past, closeness future, closeness then. There is a summons in the present. And, you know, once we appreciate in this vein what the remembrance means, what indeed this remembrance of shofar blasts is for, what the significance of this holy day is, we got to think a much better sense of how profoundly optimistic and upbeat is the Bible's message in speaking of remembrance. Because recall in Numbers chapter 10, it is this remembrance, being remembered as it were before God, that is the basis of your salvation. You will be saved from your enemies, enemies of all sorts. Once you get your bearings, once you remember where you came from, where you're heading, who you are, once you wake up, that remembrance is indeed the greatest blessing. And it's especially instructive to compare this. I think we made this point last year as well, but I feel it bears repeating. To compare this with a different kind of New Year celebration that is so common in the secular world outside. A New Year celebration divorced from God, divorced from godliness. A New Year celebration that has become so common in the Western world that we could perhaps best describe using a familiar American expression as the Wild West. And you all know very well what kind of demented wildness I mean here. The drunken carousing the utter abject materialism. A message of celebration that we should note comes straight out of a page in Isaiah. Because when Isaiah describes the behavior of the godless in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 13, Behold! Rejoicing in happiness. Kill the cattle, slaughter the sheep. Make a big party. Eating meat and drinking wine. Eat and drink. For tomorrow we die. The slogan of the secular, godless New Year. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die. And to superficial flesh and blood eyes, looks like a lot of fun. Seems like an awful lot more upbeat than entering into the houses of prayer and spending most of the day talking to God and hearing a ram's horn being blown. But, you know, when you consider the underlying messages of these two behaviors, there can be nothing more pessimistic than eat, drink, and be merry 
for tomorrow we die. There is nothing to look forward to. So you may as well just live in the moment because the moment is all you've got. As opposed to living in eternity. Again, remembering past, remembering future as a roadmap to making the most of the present and living most of all in God's presence with His closeness because that after all is the greatest gift. So again, when you look at the celebration of this remembrance of Shofar blasts, in practice, you see people crying, weeping. And you say, oh, this is just so, so morbid, so melancholy, so sad. Well, you know, it's not something new. Consider, please, the message that emerges in Nehemiah chapter 8, which is the first place in Scripture where we read explicitly about the manner in which this holy day, again, first day of seventh month, was observed. Because in Nehemiah chapter 8, first, we're told explicitly in verse 2 that Ezra, the high priest, brings the Torah before all the assembly, men and women, all who understand to hear on the first day of the seventh month. First day, seventh month. That is this holy day, Rosh Hashanah. And Ezra reads to them the message of the Torah in verse 8, reading in the book of the Torah of the Lord, the teaching of the Lord. And Nehemiah, together with Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites who are explaining it to the people, they feel constrained to tell them, today is a holy day to God your Lord. Don't mourn. Don't cry. Because the reaction of the people was crying. The people were crying, all of them, when they heard the words of the Torah. Because they remembered. Because they understood. They understood well enough to realize just how far they had gone. And you cry with homesickness when you realize you're so far away from home. But the message was today is a holy day to God your Lord. Don't be sad. And in verse 10, go and have a sumptuous banquet, make a celebration, because today is holy to our Lord, and don't be sad, because exulting in God is your fortress. That's your might. It's a day of remembrance. And when you remember, you really can be moved to tears. But those tears really should summon a greater happiness.
it's not tears of empty sorrow for something lost. It's crying over something that's missing. And if I focus, I can bring it back. And so indeed, in verse 11, the Levites calm down the people. Don't be sad. And the people went to eat and drink and send gifts to one another and make a great rejoicing, a great celebration. Because they understood. Because they remembered. A remembrance, again, of Shafar blasts. On the one hand, intimating judgment, which is called remembrance. On another hand, on a deeper plane, becoming worthy of that remembrance because we remember, because we allow ourselves to be awakened. It is a summons to which we respond. And finally, on a deeper level yet, recognizing that we're summoned to put together the brokenness of the Tu'ah with the fixing of the Tki'ah. Because there's nothing more whole, after all, than a broken heart. And when the Tu'ah calls our attention, wakes us up, breaks our heart. That's the means for becoming whole again, for returning to God, and indeed making ourselves worthy of being remembered. It would be wholly inappropriate for me to end without mentioning one additional dimension of which I'm sure all of you are aware. It's been noted repeatedly over the course of the day in the radio news reports here, and that is that today is September 11th. Talk about wake-up call. Talk about a summons to remember. So indeed, we have that summons to remember. We have that wake-up call. Eleven years ago, the events of September 11th took place as the commemoration this year, less than a week before Rosh Hashanah, before the Day of Remembrance, which is the Day of Judgment. We don't have any explanations. Nor will we. Not in this world. Anyone who purports to have explanations for such horrific calamities is trivializing God and trivializing God's governance of the world. There are no trivial, facile answers to questions like this. But this much we know for us who survive, who remain, this too is a summons. The shofar is waking us up. This is waking us up. We need to wake up. We need to remember. And by our waking up, and by our remembering, we too become worthy of being remembered for the good. God bless you all. And a happy, uplifting, and most of all, close New Year to us all. A year of closeness, a year of return, a year of homecoming again.
God bless you.